you just keep coming to church just as you are, but the promise is you're not going to stay the way you are because the same God that delivered me is the same God that will deliver you. The same God that transformed me is going to transform you. The same God that changed me is going to change you. The same God that healed me is going to heal you. So I just simply want to title this The Fishing Business or Our Father's Family Business. Now, if I was the godfather, I'd say this. The family business (laughs) is fishing. I want to talk a little bit about the family business, which is fishing. But in Matthew 13 and verse number 47, Jesus said this. Once again, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. Now this statement, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, is a familiar phrase in the Gospels. Whenever you read it, you need to pay attention to because he's going to describe to us what the kingdom of God looks like. He's going to describe to us our responsibilities as Christ's followers. And he's going to use an allegory or some symbolisms to draw the point. So he says to function in the kingdom of God, if you're going to understand God, you're going to have to understand fishing. If you don't understand the discipline and the practice and the sport of fishing, you will never understand how that relates to us as a Christian in our responsibilities. See, the kingdom of God exists and functions through fishing. It's an evangelical word. Jesus uses this common vocation, occupation, or sport to drive a symbolic presentation to us of our mission, our mandate, our ministry, and the message that you and I have. You cannot run far from who we are without understanding fishing. In other words, as it is in the natural when it comes to fishing, So is it in the spiritual. And if you will understand how to function as fish or the fish function and as the fisherman functions, you will understand the parallel of being a Christian. You know, when my boys were very, very young, um, they kept asking me, Daddy, will you take us fishing? Daddy, we want to learn how to fish. Daddy, we want to go fishing. And I don't know out of, out of initiative or love, but pretty much out of them nagging me, I decided to go ahead and do that. And, and I went to Walmart, and I bought all the tackle. I bought all the gear. I bought the bait. I bought the poles. We looked the part. We loaded up the truck, and the boys were in the truck, and it was about after work. I got off a little early, so it was a Friday at about 4 p.m. on our 15 freeway going north, and it was traffic. Not only was there traffic, there was an accident. We got on on Foothill Boulevard, and an hour and a half later, we were not at Sierra Boulevard yet. So in this hour and a half stretch, I'm having conversations with my boys saying, are you sure you want to go fishing? Yes, daddy, we want to go fishing. You know, five minutes later, are you really sure? You know, it's probably going to be like this all the way up there. I'm not even sure we're going to be able to fish today. By the time you get there, you're going to be really tired. So I kept saying, do you want to go fishing? I said, well, I guess not, daddy. I said, good. And we turned off on the next exit, turned around and came home. We oftentimes as Christians are the same way. We have all the good intentions to go fishing for people. But there somewhere along the line through the frustration and the distraction and the busyness of life, we just turn around and go home and never go fishing because it's too tough. It's too difficult. So I want to navigate through that conversation today, and I'm going to ask you to turn over to Matthew because Matthew in verse number four begins to describe the fishing business to us. There have been great spiritual fishermen in our history and our past as Christians, like Billy Graham, Reinhard Bunke, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, Stanley Jones, D.L. Moody, and Billy Sunday. All of them have won thousands upon millions of people into the kingdom of God. Kevin Van Dam may not be a name that's familiar to you, but he's worth approximately $8 million. He's a six-time world champion when it comes to fishing. Six-time world champion. I want to talk a little bit about some of the greatest fishermen in the Bible. Jonah was a reluctant fisherman, but he fished, caught a lot of fish in Nineveh. 
Philip was a fisherman and he caught the Ethiopian eunuch. He was a great fisherman. We find out that the Bible is full of great fishermen. The number one greatest fisherman of all time is Jesus. Jesus fished for all kinds of races, all kinds of status, all kinds of vocation and occupation of people. Let me show you some of his trophies of fish that he caught. We're talking about people now. He caught a fish called a woman at the well. He caught a fish called a woman caught in the midst of adultery. She was half naked having sex when they caught her. And he fished for her and he got her saved. There was a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. She was full of the devil. She had seven devils in her. He fished. He caught her. He's a rich, wealthy man. He was a head of an organization called Tax Collectors. His name was Zacchaeus. Jesus fished for him and he caught him. There was a man, Simon Cyrene, that he fished for, and he caught him. There was a man on the thief on the cross next to him. He fished for him. He caught him. There were some apostles called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He fished for them. Simon, Judas, Andrew, Bartholomew, Thaddeus. All these were people that Jesus fished for, and he caught them. He's the greatest fisherman of all time. See, Jesus uses the... The picture of fishing, the symbolism of fishing. He, f- he fed 5,000 people with what? Okay, the, I don't know what service this is, but the other services were loud. I, excuse me, I don't know. He fished for 4,000 people with what? Fish. And he caught them. He found a coin in what mouth of a fish? You guys are good Bible students, okay. He, he used fishing allegories all the time when it came to fishing. When he, when, he let, uh, when he reached out to Peter, Peter had fished all night and caught nothing. And Jesus said, cast your net. And they caught a boatload of... After the resurrection, the, they, Peter said, let us go fishing. And his friends went with him. Jesus was by the lakeside. He was, had a fire going. And he said, cast your net again. And they pulled in a haul of 153 fish she's the master fisherman and in a few moments you're going to take his class and I hope you graduate because if you graduate you're going to be getting a certificate and you will leave this place as a master fisherman so here it starts off Matthew 4 and it goes like this Matthew 4 and verse 18 and Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers Simon called Peter and Andrew they were casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen they were professional fishermen Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you a fishers of men. So they immediately left their nets and followed him. Mark's version, and as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, cast in a net uh, into the sea, for they were fishermen. Luke's version, watch this. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for what? People. You're very familiar with fishing for natural fish. You know how to bait the hook. You know how to cast the net. You know how to bring in the line. You know how to clean the fish. You know how to take them to market. I'm going to teach something that you are naturally good at to teach you how it is to operate in the kingdom of God. And if you'll be just as good in the natural as you are in the spiritual, the kingdom of God will grow. So he says the first thing is this. The first thing he says is, is that I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. He says this, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. So in reality, you're not following Jesus the way he wants you to follow him if you're not fishing. Hey everyone, we want to thank you for watching Real with Diego. If you would like weekly updates on our upcoming episodes, please visit and like our Facebook page and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You know, without each and every one of you, this show would not be where it is today. We couldn't do without you. So please make sure you like, repost, and share. We want to stay connected with you. The more sharing, the better. He says, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. I don't know if you've ever seen the fish symbol. It's a fish symbol that is recognizable all around the world and uh, through history. This fish symbol uh, this uh, exotheus is a fish symbol. And it was the way early followers identified themselves with one another. 
Notice, why didn't they do a pig? Why didn't they do an elephant? Why didn't they do a horse, a dog, a zebra? Why did they choose to use a fish as their emblem? There's something symbolic about Christians and fishing. Christians ought to fish. If you're going to follow Christ, the closeness, the intimacy of your relationship is based on fish. Second thing he says, follow me and I will make you a fisherman because you don't know how. I don't know how. I need the master fisherman to teach me how. And the way God is going to make you a fisherman is three things I want to give you today. He's going to make you a fisherman by giving you opportunity. He's going to make you a fisherman by giving you conviction. And he's going to make you a a fisherman by the help of the Holy Spirit. See, he's going to set it up. It's almost as though you're going to trip over. You're going to see a need. Someone's going to start a conversation. You're going to hear about their background. He's going to set the opportunity up. You don't have to do it. It'll come right before you in your job, in a Starbucks, at the market. You'll just see the window. It'll open up really, really quick. There it is. And then it'll close really quick. He'll create the opportunity for you. So you're, the opportunity might look like this. You go to work and you see your friend who's normally happy, but they're sad. And you go to them and you say, how are you doing? And they say, not too good. There it is. There's the opportunity. See, you said, let's go have a Slurpee. So then it went shh, shh, closed right then. It's similar to that. Okay. So he creates the opportunity, then he gives you conviction. I don't know about you, when those opportunities come and I walk away, I say, dang, he set it up. Why was I so unashamed or busy or distracted? Help me, Lord. Then the Holy Spirit is the one who knows how to lead people, who knows how to give you the words to say. So you have to depend on the Holy Spirit to do that. He said, I will make you a fisherman and you will become that fisherman. So it's a process. Don't get discouraged. We all fail. It does not come naturally. Nobody is born with the gift to to be a fisherman. It is one of the hardest things to do is to have a conversation with a stranger or have a conversation with a friend about hell, about heaven, about the cross, about eternity, about sin. It's one of the hardest things. Everybody gets nervous because I don't know if I'm going to say the right words. And then they ask me, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And I'm not going to know what came first, the chicken or the egg. How does dinosaurs play in creation? Who was, who was God's father? What, does, does Jesus say OMG to himself? I don't know. It's too difficult for me. But I want you to say, he says this, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. Notice he could have said a thousand things that he wants to make you. I'll make you highly successful. I'll make you an entrepreneur. I'll make you a businessman. I'll make you a contractor. I'll make you a lawyer. I'll make you a doctor. Notice he cares more about fishing. See, that's where we get messed up. We put our vocation or occupation in front of fishing. So that means we do our occupation, and if I get any other time, then I'll do fishing. But you don't realize you go to work to fish for the opportunities that God will present to you. So he says, I will make you a fisherman, and then you will do your plumbing. Then you will do your landscaping. Then you will do your lawyering or your doctoring. But when you're on your job, always be available to see if I want you to fish. If I create the opportunity. If I don't create the opportunity, you don't have to fish. But if I create the opportunity, drop the hook, drop the hook, drop the hook, drop the hook. So today, now I'm going to transition over here to my cooking show. I want to welcome you to Diego's cooking show. And tonight's recipe and on the menu, you got it, is fish. But Jesus told me to teach you how to fish. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, bad accent. This is all you get. You didn't pay no money, so you don't get anything better than that. So, I want to read to you a few scriptures that proves to you that Jesus was the master fisherman. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Notice Jesus is teaching you how to fish. This woman is a core sinner, okay? She's raw. She's raw. She looks for love in all the wrong places. She'll lay down with any man. 
okay? She's had five husbands and she's shacking right now. Okay, this is the woman. This is real life today. Jesus is going to have a conversation. Notice what he does. I don't know if he was really thirsty or he was playing it. I was going, (laughs) hey, I'm thirsty. Can you get me some water? What she should have said is no and kept walking, but she didn't, and he lured her in. He was baiting the hook. Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God who is with you, who says, give me a drink of water, you would ask him and he would give you living water. He's trying to form conversations. He's trying to drop curiosity bombs. He's looking for interaction and responses. Look at the progression of the conversation. Jesus asked and said to her, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. Are you interested? Isn't that crazy? Ask me a question. How is it if I drink this water, I'll thirst again? My thirst will be quenched. Tell me what you mean. Jesus said to her, hey, go call your husbands here. See, he didn't start off with go go, go call your husband. He started off with, I'm just a little thirsty. Just to see if people will talk to him, to open up their lives. And then it goes on and it says, "Uh, and you have had five husbands and one you are now with is not really your husband. Then she finally says, who the heck are you? And eventually she gives her heart to Jesus Christ and changes her lifestyle. But notice how the master fisherman fishes. He just doesn't go to her and say, you're going to go to hell. Stop shacking. He doesn't do that. He's smart about how he fishes. So here's what I want to share with you today. I want to talk a little bit about fish today. I want to talk about these beautiful things called people. So when he refers to fish, he's talking about people today. And here's what you need to understand if you don't know. Here's what you need to understand about fish. Fish are slippery and they're slimy and they're stinky. Just the way you used to be. Slippery and some of you are still are stinky. But that's okay. Because you're a fish. So don't be overwhelmed when you rub up against, uh, when you rub up against people that are stinky, slimy, and slippery. Because they're fish. They smell the way they smell. They talk the way they talk. They dress the way they dress. They live the way they live because they're fish. They don't know how to be anything other than fish. So don't condemn them. Don't judge them. Just accept the fact that they're fish and they're slippery and they're slimy and they're stinky. Hey, they say the number one reason why people don't go to church is because they've never been invited. I want to invite you to our church, Abundant Living Family Church. Now, I want to prepare you. It's, it is a big campus. It's on 30 acres and thousands and thousands of square feet of building. It's a 4,000 seat auditorium. But I want you to know it's made up of people. It's made up of individuals. And we care about people. And though we're thousands of family members, I care about everyone. Jesus cares about everyone. And we care about everyone. So whether you're a guest or you're a visitor or you call this your home church and you regularly attend, it doesn't matter. We'd be honored that you would come, however you'd get here, through a skateboard, a bike, or a train, or an automobile. Come and say hello to me. Let me know you're watching us on Real. God bless. Understand this that fish are very, very expensive, and their value is sometimes very strong. If you're a fisherman, then you know one of the most expensive fishes on the planet is a bluefin tuna. If you've ever seen one of these reality shows, you will see, especially the Japanese. They will spend tons of money for our bluefin tuna. Recently in Japan, a 490-pound blue tuna, bluefin tuna, was bought, watch this, for $1.8 million to one of the finest chef's sushi restaurants in Japan. People pay $1.8 million for something that's stinky, slimy, and stinky. If you have a saltwater aquarium, then you are familiar with some of these fishes that cost a lot of money. One of the most expensive fish is called a platinum arana. It costs $400,000. 
We don't seem to value people as much as Jesus values people. Enough that he died for a person who was a sinner. He values people. We don't seem to value people. We value our cars. We value our homes. We value our dress. And people are just a commodity that come and go in our lives. But they're of great value to Jesus. We must recognize fish will always fight you. Fish are not going to jump into your boat. Fish are not going to jump into your plate for you to consume them. Fish are going to fight you. And so when you go up, however you have conversations with sinners, and you hear, get that Jesus junk out of my face. I don't believe in God. You need a crutch. They're fighting you. They're not jumping in the boat with you. That's their nature. They're supposed to fight, resist against you. They don't come easy. So they're going to fight. They're going to resist. They're not going to want to accept. So whatever you hear that comes out of your mouth, out of their mouth, don't get upset. They're fighting. The moment you heard the gospel, did you repent? Look at you've heard it so many years and you still haven't repented. What does that say? I'm just trying to be real. They're going to fight you. And however they fight you with honoriness and yelling at you and cussing and get that Jesus stuff and no, I'm never going to come to church. I don't believe in God. They're supposed to fight because that's the nature of fish. Sometimes you only get one chance to catch a fish. Because if you spook him, he'll go away and you may never get that chance again. So you got to recognize however God sets up that opportunity. Don't think that I'll work on it tomorrow or, you know what, I'm, this isn't a good time or, God, I'm so scared right now and I'm busy. You sometimes get one chance. And how many times has that happened to me? A thousand times. A thousand times. And then when that happens, I have to pray and say, Lord, send another laborer that maybe could water the seed or plant the seed or do a better job than I did because I recognize I only got one chance to do that, to catch that fish. Sometimes I want you to realize that fish are very, very nutritious. Fish are very, very healthy. When I uh, came off of um, traditional treatment when it came to cancer and I went all naturopathic, pristine diet, the one thing that I ate a ton of, it was the only thing in my, it was raw salmon because it was filled with omega-3s. Actually, some 10 years later, if you look at every morning for breakfast, I have raw salmon. Every morning. Because it's, it's filled with omega-3s in it. What am I trying to say? Fish are very nutritious. Who are they nutritious to? They're nutritious to your health. Because if you're not winning souls, you're dying. If you're not winning souls, you become selfish. If you're not winning souls, you become judgmental and critical. You start murmuring. You're depressed. The things in the church start bothering you. Listen, how can I murmur about the lights? How can I murmur about the, the sound? How can I murmur about anything if I'm out winning souls? It's usually a sign that you are not healthy as a Christian when you've got all this energy to talk about and to gossip about paint, about sound, about lights. Winning souls keeps your heart very, very healthy. I want you to recognize who is Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, the one that was born in a manger that we celebrate during Christmas time, and the one that died on the cross when we celebrate Easter. Who is Jesus to you? Is he the family Bible that you have or has been given to you in your home? Who is Jesus? Is he a, a prayer that you hear at the end of talking to God? Who is Jesus? Is he a crucifixion or is he a cross that you wear around your neck? It's a great question. Who is Jesus to you? Is he just someone that you cry out to when you're in an emergency or in the midst of an accident? I know, maybe Jesus is just a cuss word for you that you say when you're scared. The reality we have to answer is, who is Jesus to you? Is he just your mama or your grandmother's religion and faith? Who is Jesus? 
Was he a moral man? Was he a prophet? Was he a, a healer? Was he the leader of a movement? Was he a, a revivalist? Was he a revolutionist? Who is Jesus? Well, I'm here to tell you, Jesus to me is someone that changed my life. He touched my life. In 1978, I invited him into my life. I grew up in religion. I went to eight years of a religious school, and if I was to die at that point, I would have split hell wide open on a grease bowl. Because I had a relationship with religion. I thought Jesus was the church building. I thought Jesus was a religion. I thought Jesus was a creed. I didn't really know that Jesus was a person. A person that loves me and accepts me, and a person that has a purpose for my life, person that wants to help me through my greatest hurts, pains, and difficulties, a person that already knows my struggles and weaknesses and has loved me even in spite of, a person that wants to change me and transform me to be somebody that is uh, honored and respected and somebody that could be a great leader and cause great difference and make an, make, make an influence wherever uh, he chooses a vocation or an occupation. Jesus is someone that wants to be your best friend, someone that he wants to do life with you today. Jesus really is, in that 1978 when I accepted him, the one that forgave me of my sins and radically came into my life and transformed my life. Today, if you want change and you want to meet the real Jesus, not the storybook Jesus, maybe not the Sunday school Jesus, maybe not someone else's Jesus, but your personal Jesus that you call my Savior, my Lord, my friend, my everything. I want you to open your heart now. Say, Jesus, I ask you to come and live in my heart and be my Lord and be my Savior. Change me into what you want me to be. From this moment forward, I'm a child of God. God bless you. Hey everyone, we want to get to know you just a little bit more. So if you have any question or simply want to reach out to us and let us know how you feel, then please message us. Or you can visit our Facebook page and leave a comment or even share a video if you like. Whatever way that you want to share your life, we're all the way down. But just make sure you do one simple thing for us, come as you are. Hey, thank you for watching. If you're ever in the SoCal, Southern California, LA area, we want to invite you to physically come and be with us. We have a great viewing audience. We have a live streaming audience. We have a Facebook audience. But I'd love to be able to shake your hand, be introduced. So if you're ever in the area, come to one of our many services. But most of all, come up to me because we get really encouraged when we meet our television audience.